right. Okay, we'll go ahead and call the Wilmer City Council work session to order. Uh, is there any public that wishes to make a comment this evening? Seeing and hearing none, the first thing we have on the agenda is the airport master plan update. Melissa Underwood from Boltman Mink. Melissa, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Again, my name is Melissa Underwood. I'm an aviation planner with Boltman Mink. And over the last year, I've been working with a master plan advisory group to update the 20 year master plan for the airport. The previous plan was, was done before the new runway and new airport was built. So it was time to um, look at the plan again and look at the next 20 years for the airport. What I have today is a presentation that we gave at a public open house in November that kind of recaps the project. So I can briefly go over that with you and then just open it up to any questions you may have. I'll start by talking about what a master plan is and the group that we pulled together to work on the project. We'll go over kind of what the process of the master plan is, the airport conditions and the service area, and then look at the forecast and the future of the year plan and what the next steps will be for the master plan process. So a master plan is a, a goal the FAA has to give a comprehensive look at the airport and what will happen over the next 20 years. And one of FAA's goals is to have the master plan included with the city's comprehensive plan. It goes over short, medium, and long-term development for um, capital improvement projects at the airport. It looks at the existing and future users of the airport and how to accommodate their needs. It also gives the city kind of goals and, and plans to look forward to at the airport whenever the justification arises for this development. So there was a master plan advisory group that we put together to all work on this project. There were 13 local representatives, airport commission members, businessmen, economic development commission members, city council representatives, city staff, and they all came together. We met five times over about 12 month period to go over this plan. We also had members of the Federal Aviation Administration and MnDOT Aeronautics on board as well. So the steps of the master plan are to gather an inventory of what's out at the airport today, look at who uses the airport today and who's planned to use it over the next 20 years. We gather based aircraft and operations data and then look at what needs the airport has to accommodate those users. We develop alternatives to meet those needs and then develop a um, capital improvement program and a financial analysis to address the financial side of that development. This is a layout of the existing airport. There's currently a 5,500 foot um, paved runway and, whoops, sorry about that, and a 2,800, 980 foot turf runway, a parallel taxiway. There's an instrument approach to one of the runway ends, which helps pilots come in when the weather isn't perfect for flying, and um, two building areas. You can see on this map there's an area um, for private hangar development and then an area for um, aircraft owners to rent hangars from the city. There's the terminal building with an apron space for parking and then um, fixed space oper operators or businesses at the airport and automobile parking. But one of the first steps we did was send out a user survey to kind of the service area where the airport for port is. The, the green colored shading is the 30 minute drive time around the airport and that's how FAA establishes how close together airports should be. They want everybody to be within a 30 minute drive time of the airport but they want airports to be at least that far apart. The red line is the halfway point between the surrounding general aviation airports and this looks at the key airports in the state. So every airport in the state has a category and Wilmer is a key airport because the runway length is 5,000 feet or more. So the other airports in the area with that runway length are Alexandria, St. Cloud, New Ulm, and um, Southwest Minnesota Regional Airport or Marshall. So we also looked at the service area that Wilmer serves compared to those airports. And based on those surveys and the forecasts that we put together, there are 48 based aircraft at the airport today and over the next 20 years we see that increasing to 65 based aircraft. There's approximately 20,000 operations at the airport and an operation is a, a landing and then another operation for a takeoff. 
And then we also look at the size of aircraft that use the airport to help plan for what the future should be. Right now, Wilmer is in this C2 large category. So these corporate jets are the type of airplanes that can use the airport today. And then also the turf runway helps with the smaller agricultural sprayers or the smaller single engine aircraft that also use the airport. And here's kind of a list of all the different types of air, aircraft that were um, shown to use the airport. So after gathering all that data, we looked at runway lengths and what we would need to accommodate these users over the next 20 years. And we went through alternatives with that master plan advisory group, and the ones I'm showing here are the selected or preferred alternatives. And <coughs> what this boils down to is the selected alternatives, which I'll run through, are included on the airport layout plan, which is what FAA will approve as the city's 20-year plan for the airport. And the other piece of the project is the report that explains everything on the airport layout plan, and the forecast in that chapter chapter in that report are also approved by FAA. So one of the plans that's happening is looking at a runway extension to 6,500 feet. It's not justified to build this runway extension today or in the next three years, but it's something to look at over the next 5, 10, 15 years to see if these aircraft continue to use the airport and would require this runway length. The city already owns the airport property to do this runway extension. The biggest part of the project would be the relocation um, of a county road to go outside of the safety areas for that runway extension. That'd be the biggest piece of that project. Also, the um, county staff members were also on our master plan advisory group, so they were you know, working with us on any road relocations and they attended the public open house. So we have um, people from the public aware of these projects and the potential impacts, but as I mentioned, it's more of a 10, 15 year plan for the airport. The other biggest um, development we came up with was to pave the crosswind runway. We looked at different alternatives on how to maximize the space um, because of we know about the Highway 12 relocation project and there's also a natural gas pipeline that runs around, along the 2-1 end of the runway. So those were considerations when we took into account when planning for the crosswind. And what we ended up with is a 3,000 foot paved crosswind runway. It keeps the safety areas outside of that pipeline, which is important to FAA because once safety areas go over that pipeline, we would have to relocate the pipeline. And that's a very expensive endeavor to take. So we were keeping it at 3,000 feet. And then that would also not impact any of the Highway 12 projects that have been discussed for the city as well. So it was such an advantage to have all those members on that master plan advisory group to get all of this information as we were going through this project. The other areas of development we looked at were the building areas to continue to allow for private hangar development to meet that demand of those you know, 20 or so based aircraft over the next 20 years. And also on the west building area to look at maximizing the property and a number of hangars that could be developed there as well. Also the potential for an apron expansion and allowing additional aviation businesses to use the airport. So that was a recap of the master plan project. Um, what we're looking to do next is we're waiting for one more piece of information for the report, which is a wildlife site assessment that was done by the USDA as part of this project. Once we have that report, we'll include that in the master plan and then we'll send it out to the airport commission, to the master plan advisory group, and to city council members for any review and any comments. And then we will submit it to MnDOT and FAA for their review and approval. Once it's approved by FAA, we will then bring it again to council for final signature, just in case they make any changes to the documents. We want to wait for those comments before we bring it back to council. But they've been involved in the whole process. They've seen the report as we've written the chapters. They've seen the airport layout plans, so we don't anticipate any significant comments from them. And then you will have another 20-year plan to look at for the airport. So does anybody have any questions or want me to go in more detail about something? Melissa, thank you for your report, uh, very, very good report. Is it possible 
f to get this uh, your presentation emailed out to the council? Absolutely. Um, so that the council can review it in more detail before it comes back to us the next time. Absolutely. And just uh, just for the uh, rest of the council, I did receive an email from Dan O'Mara that he has reviewed the plan. I don't know if all the council members received that email or not, but um, that he has reviewed the plan and that he's in favor of it, but he's unable to attend because of a work commitment. So also we have Dave Little from the airport commission with us, and we also have Eric Rundigan, our fixed base operator here. So um, council, do you have any questions for anybody along the way here? Council Member Alvarado. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's, it's good to see you again. Um, now, can you just share with the public that whether or not we have like UPS or, or, or some of those planes flying into the airport, I was asked about that. Um, is that true that they do use the airport on a regular basis? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the companies. Um, and Eric would be able to provide more detail, but um, there are corporate users that do use the airport on a regular basis, and that's what brought about the p potential for a runway extension, like UPS. I can't think of. So the Bemidji Aviation has a contract with UPS, and they. Can you come to the mic, Eric, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Bemidji Aviation has a contract with UPS to do local deliveries. And so they come at this time of year daily, sometimes twice a day. It is uh, right now the packages that don't make the truck that need to be 10 o'clock delivery guaranteed will get on the airplane. Um, I, I'll toot my horn a little bit. Saturday they landed, had problems getting the airplane started. Um, they are a part 135 operator, so they have specific requirements for maintenance personnel working on their airplane. In other words, it has to be their maintenance people. They uh, started their maintenance people coming from Bemidji to Wilmer. We pushed their airplane, emptied the hangar, pushed their airplane in the heated hangar so they'd have a warm place to work. They got it fixed up and were able to get the rest of the packages on. We felt like we were kind of fixing Santa's sleigh on Saturday <laughs> morning. but. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons that you want somebody around at the airport, uh, f quite frankly. But yes, Bemidji is using it on a regular basis, and that is a UPS package hauler. So, Great. Yep. Um, I've got uh, another question, Mr. Mayor. Um, you you re referenced Key Airport. What does, what does that mean? So the state does their own 20-year comprehensive plan for all the airports in the state of Minnesota. And they've divided the airports into three categories, Key, Intermediate, and Landing Strip. There are 135 airports in Minnesota. There are 30 or 35 that are key airports, and that just means that your runway is 5,000 feet or longer, that you serve business-type airports on a regular basis, and you have the facilities to meet their needs, such as 24-hour, 100 low lead and jet A fuel. You have a fixed-based operator at your airport. So there are certain requirements the state has to put you into that category. Okay. I've got one more question, if, if I can, Mr. Mayor. Oh, and I just lost it. No, I got it. Um, I was talking to a, a gentleman from Watertown, South Dakota, and they have a uh, program uh, with a company called ADI. Maybe you're familiar with them. I don't know. And they fly from Watertown to Pierre to Denver, um, and the jet is a, like a 50-passenger passenger jet, I guess. Would we, if we had some sort of program like that, would we be able to accommodate something like like that with the, um, with our airport? Yeah, a lot of it is based on pavement strength, and your pavement strength could accommodate aircraft of that size. They may have to come in with less fuel or less passengers of that size, but the runway length can accommodate that type of aircraft. It's just pilot discretion, and then they may have to make some concessions. Okay. I just thought it was interesting that... Mm -hmm. I don't know that Watertown, South Dakota is that much bigger than a Wilmer, but I just thought it was interesting that they were shuttling people from their airport via pier to Denver. I thought that was, and there's parameters, I understand, but I thought that was interesting. Thank you very much. Councilmember Nelson, followed by Christensen. Thank you, Mayor Calvin. Just a follow-up question. How do we report the information to the state? How do we toot our horn so that um, they know about the good things we do and fix Santa's sleigh and all those kinds of things. A lot of it is meetings with them. They, um, they came out to the airport in 
maybe September, October, and they do a needs meeting where all MnDOT staff comes out and there were a group of city representatives and Eric and other people that are there to talk about the airport, what the airport's plans are. And they're very open to communication, emails, phone calls, so we're in constant contact with them and just share the news that we have. But they do come out and visit the airport, you know, usually once a year, every three years for sure, they get around to all the airports, but it's just that type of communication. Okay, thank you. Councilmember, no, uh, Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The improvements that you mentioned up there, uh, are all of them available with uh, funding from the state and federal government also? Correct. Same percentages, 95 and 5 or something like that? Right now, the federal share is 90-10, and the state is picking up an extra 5%, so the local share on projects that are justified and eligible are 5%. That's good through the state fiscal year of 2019, and then after that, we have to determine if there's gonna be that extra 5% match. The federal government's had the 90-10 for quite a while. We anticipate that to continue, but it always depends on, on government and what Congress passes, but that's been the standard. But do they have to approve it? I mean, you submit it, and then they uh, say yes or no, we'll, we'll uh, do the 90-10 split? Right, right. They have to, the, ju the project has to be justified based on your operations and the type of improvements you need, and it has to be eligible according to their handbook. Everything we show on the airport layout plan is eligible. Once it's justified, they're willing to fund it. But you just have to work through their steps each year with your capital improvement program to have it funded and have them approve that the money is available. And then the uh, added runway crosswind, I know you set a time on there, but <coughs> five years, 10 years, or? More like the 10, 15, 20 year okay, time frame, so quite not a ways an immediate, out. right. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for your report. Um, you know, our airport is a key piece of economic development for a community, and you're very well aware of that because you work on this on a regular basis. So um, I think a lot of times people aren't aware of how many aircraft we actually have coming and going. Mm -hmm. And so a report like this really brings it to the forefront and lets people know. The other thing that I want to do is, and I'm sure that you've worked very closely with our airport commission, and you know they do a very nice job for our community. They're serving on a volunteer basis to review all of this information and then help assemble this report to then present to us. But they are the conduit to us as a council on how we should be moving forward. And then for the council's uh, brief on this is what we do on this is when we have capital improvement needs, those come through the budgeting process and then they come to the council for approval and then we fund those at full amount and then what generally happens is then whatever that local match requirement is, that then comes back. And we did that last year, I believe, Steve, right? That we, uh, we, we did one of the projects out there and came back with, I think that was a 5% match requirement. But. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, what the city usually does is if we are aware that there is a cost share, it's budgeted that way. And if there's a project that we d are uncertain when we are budgeting for it, we will put the full amount in as you described. And then at a later date when we have confirmed funding, then we adjust it accordingly. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilman Romeski. So the 10% that's local, you said it can be offset by 5% state. Do we put off on ours, our budget then the 10% or do we budget for five or do we wait to find out? It all depends upon what the project is. But like, like our finance director said, like last year we, we funded 100%. And then when we found out we got the grant, then we backed that down to the 10%. When we found out we got the 5% match from the state, we backed it down the additional 5%. So that's how we do it. So when a project, the project has to be funded before you're eligible for the, for the dollars. I understand That's that. how we have to do it. I understand that. Um, is there ever a, ever a time when the um, state dollars do not come in for an approved federal program? It's, would... it's only been since 2014 that they've provided the extra 5% because they wanted to spend more of their airport funds. So usually when the FAA funds a project, the state will also participate because they both kind of have the same requirements for Eligibility. Okay. Well, let's again thank you for your report. Thank you for the good work you're doing for our community. And uh, we look forward to your final report when you have everything all ready to go with a bowl, saying in the Christmas spirit. So thank you well, so thank much. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. Next, we have our finance department report, Mr. Okins. 
Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, we have our monthly uh, report for you. Um, one item that I would like to mention is the capital report is not included in this one. We had uh, no changes from the last report that was given to you. Um, the process that we will use going forward will be to include the report again and just say that there was no activity rather than not include the report. So that was an oversight on our, on our part. Um, this is the report as of November 30th. Um, we do have some updates as well. Uh, same rep format that we've had. If there are comments or the council wants to change the format, just let our office know and we'll be more than happy to do that. Um, page three, you'll see that our investment balance did not change from the previous month. Um, all indications in working with our brokers and stuff is that the feds were going to increase the fed fund rates, which they did by 25 basis points. Um, we are working with our brokers uh, in the upcoming sheets, we will show you the maturities that we have, um, the dollars and the cash we have on hand right now um, will be needed in February for our bond payments. And so uh, we have been working with some local banks to try to get some additional accounts that will give us better rate on our, on our more fluid funds. But uh, the portfolio right now is kind of end loaded and that was that way when our office received it. Uh, back in September of 2016. And so we're working on trying to more ladder our investments a little more in the current years. And the current years would be from one year to four years. Mr. Okins, you said 25 basis points. It's 0.25 basis points or 25 basis points? 0.25. Correct. 25 basis points is, is 0.25%, quarter percent. Page four starts the uh, listing of our investments. You'll see here, as I mentioned, uh, we have very little uh, maturing in the, in the next three years, uh, especially in 18. Um, so we are working and, and looking at that. Um, uh, most of these, again, were in place when our office received uh, the portfolio. And uh, the, the current status uh, we are working on. Uh, the rates are a little better. That was some of the reasons we held off, but again, cash flow drives a lot of that as well. Page five is just a continuation of that listing. Uh, you'll see or notice here that a number of the investments have a range of in, uh, interest rates, and they call those step-ups. And at certain points, the interest rate will step up to a next uh, accelerated level. Um, those were being purchased and uh, the call dates, um, I, I see we don't have that on there. We were experiencing a number of investments that were being called, meaning that we had an investment and interest rates uh, were uh, pretty steady. And so a step up, when the interest rate would go up, the bank would call it back in and so they would basically cash it in. And we were experiencing, uh, in, in the end of, of 2016, a large number of investments being called. And so we were uh, investing a lot of these, and, and the former city clerk treasurer did a lot of the step-ups uh, with the anticipation that, that we would probably still experience that. As interest rates have uh, increased slightly or, or been in, inching up, we're not seeing that activity at this point. And so we're kind of taking that into consideration when we're looking at our portfolio as well, uh, when those step-ups occur and, and anticipating when they might be calling those investments. Is there a typical percent when they call those that they can climb up to? Because, I mean, obviously I know six and eight, are, they're not going there. No. But what do they usually call them? Um, it was, it... Uh, when we were experiencing a, a number of the call provisions, it all uh, was driven by the, the, the institution. There were some investments that they called and depending on the investment, we were able to reinvest at a higher rate. So it was really kind of driven by the institution. On page six uh, is again a listing of the investment as well as our, as our liquid accounts. Um, the four liquid accounts that you see here as far as the law enforcement forfeiture account, those are driven by statute. The Explorer Fund is a small account that the explorers have as, as they raise funds. The, the first two, the Flex Gold and the Commercial Checking, are both at Heritage. We have been in conversations with other institutions in town that would uh, 
be able to provide us with a better rate than those that are listed there. Um, the net amount there is about $4.8, $4.9 million. And our, our cash flow projections, we have um, the property taxes that came in in December, uh, which was about $2.5 million. Uh, that's in at this point. Um, our February bond payments, accumulative, is going to be well over $5 million. And so that's why that is sitting somewhat liquid at this point because it will be going out uh, and those bond payments are usually due February 1st and August 1st. So we take that into consideration when we uh, are looking at our cash flows and we will be presenting that and talking about cash flows in January to the council when we bring back to you our investment policy which requires an annual re review by the council. Moving on into the general funds, unless there's any questions. Um, uh, Mr. Okins, uh on your last slide there, so when, when you come back with your plan, uh, your investment plan for next month, um, if you can bring us what our auditor had asked us to have for those fund balances and just do a comparison off of that, because a number of the members of the council and myself have, have, have expressed an interest in that. Um, so that we know where those numbers are in relationship to what the auditor had stated we should have, and then how many of those are controlled by state statute, as you stated earlier, versus local control or our internal policies. And, and that would be one of the items that we would like to have, or we would have discussion with the council, is the uh, the listing of investments that I showed in the previous two slides and their maturity dates so the council wouldn't be forced into selling right. an investment. And um, we would not only have uh, the investments or cash balances per fund, but we would also uh, talk about these maturity dates. And, and we certainly would have that. Um, the investment policy requires an annual review. Uh, we would recommend that you also look at the fund balance policy uh, based on the auditor's recommendations and uh, take that into consideration at the same time or in the following month as well. Mr. Holland, can we make sure that that happens in January? So those two questions, so we have both of them. I maybe didn't ask the question right, but I think you know what yeah. I'm asking for. Yeah, um, Mr. Mayor, um, our monthly reports um, there's a certain time of the year where a January report would really be uh, not beneficial right. to talk to look at the monthly amounts, and it, it should concentrate more on the Policy. fund balances and the policies. Right. Correct. Right. Yep, I agree. Yep, thank you. Page seven lists our, our general fund revenues. Um, in this slide, um, I mentioned before um, for 11 months. We should be at uh, roughly 92%. There are some things, and we have run some numbers through the current date, just to kind of get an idea. These numbers are actually through November. Uh, I mentioned that the general property tax uh, has come in. That came in on the 15th. Um, the intergovernmental you see there is our local government aid. That comes in on the 20th. Um, I've talked about cash flow on those two large revenues where they come in twice a year, and so it does affect our cash flow and, and, uh, and um, the revenues. So um, although that we are at 61% and we should be at 92, there are uh, those two factors which have come in or will shortly come in, and those are two large items. The other item on there is the other financing sources, and that has to do with our transfers from Rice Hospital the municipal utilities and the waste treatment. So those are all a quarter, on a quarterly basis, and so those will come in as well. Um, one item that I would like to mention on this sh and, uh, and is the licenses and permits. Um, I did talk with the building inspection department uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, the large portion of that overage is due to the amount of construction that's been happening in the community. And in 2016, and we'll talk a little bit about, or I mentioned a little bit about this in the budget process, is that in 2016, we had $36 million of new construction. Of that amount, $26 million was really taxable new construction. Um, he has a, a number of permits that they are reviewing presently that will still affect uh, this year, fiscal year in 2017, to the tune of about fifteen to $20,000 of permit fees. 
and a number of permits in the range of about $10 million in value that will transpire shortly after the first of the year, and that will be in the 2018 year. I know Councilman Oz, Osmus had, had questioned that when we were looking at the budget. In, in 15, we had 600 and some thousand dollars. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tough revenue to make the decision on uh, taking an average or uh, the, the amount of construction really kind of drives that one. So unless there's any questions on that. The expenditure side of it, uh, we've talked about those. The assessing department, that was a one-time uh, transfer and, and obligation for the county taking over the assessing department. The office services, we've talked about that. In uh, that, This is the first year that we did the, the transfer and, and accounted for all the office supplies in one area rather than the various departments, and we'll be making some recommended changes uh, at the end of the year for that. And the non-departmental public safety uh, is at 97%. It's a small dollar amount, and that's uh, a one-time uh, uh, public safety uh, training and uh, um, uh, civil defense sirens, I believe. Page nine, um, again, transit system. That's uh, a one-time billing for that. That's our share of the capital for uh, the transit system, uh, the non-public public works, that is uh, periodic uh, drug testing. Um, it's driven by, um, I'm not even sure I could defer to the public works director, but it's a random, and so the, it, it varies as far as it's a small dollar amount as well. And the aquatic center, that is uh, with the final numbers through November, we just received the uh, uh, the November community ed and rec report, but there was no aquatic expenditures on there, so that should be pretty much the final numbers for that that department as well. Transfers, you see that we kind of have have not transferred anything. That's a a cash flow type item that we can uh, determine somewhat of the interest allocations in the general fund uh, is driven by that. It's an annual thing that we do, kind of clean up at the end of the year. It can be done differently than that, um, that would be kind of, uh, it would drive who is earning the interest on the investment portfolio because it's based on their, their, their share of it. And we'll talk about that in the fund balances uh, in January. The waste treatment plant, uh, again, should be at 92%, but this is always lagging one month behind because of our relationship with the municipal utilities and their collection. Um, they collect it, so we have not uh, received November, they usually take the full 30 days and then send it over to us. And so this is really for only 10 months. Um, the depreciation on the expenditure side is again an annual that we go through. Uh, we could, we're looking at changing that procedure to maybe do that monthly. Um, large items that are under budget in the treatment area are, are utilities and chemical costs. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's due to the weather or uh, we haven't had those conversations, but part of our year-end process is to meet with the departments and kind of analyze and see what, what's causing those as well. In the uh, collection side, uh, maintenance of other improvements are, are way under. We're only at 6% of what we had budgeted for that. There's about $80,000 left in that category, so we haven't had to experience a lot of maintenance on the collection side. Um, the revenues on the miscellaneous revenues, there's a lot of leachate treatment that we had not anticipated with Candy, Ojai, Cottonwood, and Renville counties. Um, I think they, uh, Candy, Ojai County, I know, had discussions where they were going to possibly pre-treat or do some type of pre-treatment at the land, landfill. Um, they're not. They're bringing it to the, the plant, and we're treating that, and they're paying a, accordingly. Um, we also have uh, a couple of businesses that are also uh, doing some leachate treatment at the plant. And the interest in market values uh, were uh, larger than anticipated. And with that, Mr. Mayor, happy to answer any questions or. Thank you for your report. Yeah, part of our process, if I could just add, is that we do send out a, a, a schedule for the departments for December um, and meet with them to go over their budgets and so they can uh, get detailed information, uh, hand their uh, invoices in daily so that we can 
make sure we monitor if they get close to going over their budgets. Well, I'm confused by what you just said. I remember when I was fire chief, we couldn't spend any money in December. That was driven by the administrator's office, Mr. Mayor, if you remember that. <laughs> Mr. Holland, put down the knife. Uh, let's see if you have any questions from Council. Council, any questions? Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a few meetings ago you mentioned that uh, uh, there's a state requirement that we have to have 50% of our operating budget set aside in the reserve. I did not, I did not, the, the state re recommends a certain level. There is no state statute that has a set requirement. No, they recommend it. I didn't mean there's a statute. Yeah, and, and that's usually recommended by the state auditor's office. It has been for a number of years. Um, a lot of that is driven by each community would be a little different. Um, if you have a community that's really dependent on their property taxes and local government aid, theirs would be probably a little higher um, for some, and again, on the expenditure side, it all it, your cash flow is really kind of drives a lot of that, a lot of that. Okay, uh, then you mentioned at the same meeting that we have about 100 percent. It's it's slightly over that even, but I, you know, I don't have that information with you. It's in the financial report. Yeah. So, that, so does that mean in excess of seven seven million dollars that we have set aside uh, above and beyond the recommendation? No, it would be closer to 13 to 14 million dollars. Okay, therefore the 100%. I see. And, the, and, and, and some of those uh, reserves are a million dollars for the self-insurance, uh, four million dollars for cash flow because of the cash flow that I mentioned on LGA and, and that gets driven. Um, their charter allows for up to two years of an emergency, up to 10% of your operating budget. And uh, the council has a fund balance policy that has a number of those levels in it. And that will be one of the items that we'll be bringing for discussion in January. But technically, that money could be used for whatever the council saw fit. That the, the, the fund excess. balances can be adjusted and set at whatever level the council would want to set it at. Um, there are some causes and effects that, that would need to be discussed. But yes, the council can do that. OK, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve, for your report. Appreciate it. Public Works Department monthly report. Mr. Christensen. Public Works Director Christensen. You can call me whatever you like, Mayor. Well, I was going to comment <laughs> on your tie and tell you that uh, you're looking festive this evening. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have quite the extensive, extensive report that uh, Mr. Okins had because, uh, as you Trying might. Show you up, is he? He did. Yep, that's a regular basis. So we'll, uh, <laughs> as you might guess, we don't have much public works going on at the moment, or at uh, this time of year. Also, I'll update you a little bit on some things that have happened and some in the in the recent recent weeks. Um, public works crews, of course, are are continually taking advantage of the nice weather and taking care of trees, trimming and removing. We're, uh, if you've noticed, a couple of the, the uh, outside hockey rinks, we've started flooding those. And so, uh, and by the looks of the weather, at the end of the week, they'll be plenty frozen. Um, we've also, um, you'll notice this season, we're going to try something a little new for, for, our, for our snow and ice removal. We've got a, a liquid application process that we're going to try, we're going to experiment with a little bit. It's a brine solution. And so we've outfitted two trucks, or we're, we're outfitting two trucks um, with these tanks, and so they'll look a little bit different um, when they get back from, from that process. So we'll try it. We're going to try it on some of the more heavily traveled roads, and uh, <clears throat> we've heard some good things about it, and so we're going to see what it does for us. And if, if, if all goes well, then the idea would be to, to outfit two more trucks next year and, and, uh, and cover the majority of the heavily traveled areas of town. The uh, auditorium lights are in, LED lights are installed and ready to go, um, and the floors are being sanded and sealed next week. So the floor for the, so the auditorium will look, uh, look pretty well updated. Um, I will say that with the new lights, you will definitely notice the ceiling issues that we have. So that will continue to be on the It's going to haunt us, huh? <laughs> well, I'll just say it will continue to be on the budgets for your, <laughs> for your, uh, um, at my, my proposed budgets. City Hall uh, carpet should be, could be installed or completed by Wednesday, we're hopeful. So uh, the new carpet that has gone down looks really, really good. And so they're, they're plugging away at that. 
with that, Mayor, I could stand for questions. I don't have very many, obviously, construction projects, outside projects going on at the moment, but um, that's kind of it in a nutshell at this point. So thank you, Sean, for your report. Um, so the concerns that we had received from the people on 16th and 17th Street Southwest, um, those issues, you were going to take care of those, and we haven't heard back, but so I'm assuming you took care of those and those people are satisfied until spring? As far as I know, do you remember what some of the concerns were? Because Well, I, some of it was uh, the uh, width of the driveways and some of the concrete that they had paid for, the driveways they had paid for this year but weren't going to be installed until next year, and then you had brought up the part where a, a truck had went in there that shouldn't have and probably settled through, yep. and then there was a couple different areas where you had made some corrections, soil corrections after the first lift was put up? Uh, yeah, so I would say the short answer is yes, those have been taken care of. The The holes have been, um, and of course no no bituminous plants are operatable right. or operational now, so um, holes will have to be filled on, on an as-needed basis over the winter. And then uh, the, the spots that surface by spring or by the, by the fall will be cut out and, and prepared or repaired as necessary and, and then the final lift to be put on. Um, I believe, yes, the, the driveway issues have been taken care of and um, our guys have met with a number of people out there that, and, uh, or the engineer has as well or, or all, all the above. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think for the most part everything's been taken care of. Yeah, and, and you know, the people that were talking with me about it, I mean, they're, they're very complimentary of you and your staff, the city staff, the more of their issue was with the contractor, not necessarily with city staff, but sure. thank you for addressing those issues. So, Council, any questions for Mr. Christensen, Council Member Elverano? Yes, uh, Mr. Christensen, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering, what what is the parameters for the new um, brine that we're going to be applying to the, the roads? So when can we expect to see the trucks out there? Is it what temperatures and those those sorts of things? Sure, and 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 uh, Councilman Alvarado, it's going to be in general in nature now because I'm not entirely com <laughs> um, positive on all the the details of it myself. So we're still doing some some experimentation with that. But uh, my understanding for these brine solutions that some of them would be good down to like a minus 20 or a minus 10 anyway for to to thaw at that at that temperature and uh, we can use some of the same same um, same supply for pre-treatment so that you can if you know snow and ice is coming um, for instance you can put some of this down at some of the intersections prior to the um, snow and ice coming and then it can it'll it'll pre melt if you will if mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense um, by and large the majority of this solution is going to be um, believe it or not, used to to wet the sand salt mixture as it goes down, because what happens is um, most of the sand salt mixture is is pushed off to the side and the curbs curb and gutters with about a half a dozen or or cars that have gone by. If it's dry, as they go by, the the, the salt and salt and sand goes out to the curb. Then our street sweeper picks it up. And so by wetting that sand and salt mixture as it goes down, it sticks to the road, it stays in the place that we put it, and uh, has a better uniform melting characteristics. Um, also, because of that, we're you know, uh, able to use less sand and salt. Mm. That sounds good. We're, we're hopeful, yes. Yeah, it's nice that we haven't had to use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I hope <laughs> we'll see what happens in the early spring. Yes, sir, thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor Calvin. Just in anticipation of the new school opening, um, or with traffic patterns changing, um, I, I know we've had this conversation before about the speed on Homer Avenue and some of those things. So I was just curious if there's any preventative things or any, any things that you're concerned about with the new school or words of wisdom for our community. Um, slow down would be the, the words of wisdom. Um, in all honesty, the um, necessary school signs have been put up and are being put up. Um, we're also, I'm also expecting a, a letter any day from the school superintendent officially requesting to reduce the, the speed at the school. Um, I was under the understanding that the state has to set all the, all the uh, speeds and on all the streets. And there's a statute, or there's a paragraph in that statute that says that the school or the local jurisdiction actually can um, 
designate a speed within parameters at a school zone. And then there's a couple other items in there too. So well, um, with that being said, we can bring that speed at the school down to 30. Um, that's the minimum speed that we can bring it down to. But uh, um, so we're, those signs are being put up maybe even this week. So in anticipation of school starting in that building. Thank you. That wouldn't affect Wilmer Avenue though, correct? Correct. That's yeah. correct. The traffic patterns on Wilmer Avenue will, will be much the same, um, even though there'll probably be more turning movements off of Wilmer Avenue, I would anticipate. Okay. And so in order to look at the speed on there, um, that's something the state does? That's correct. And quite frankly, um, if you reduce the speed that far away from the school, it would be back up again by the time it got to the school. So um, the idea is to reduce the speed at the school um, where kids may be present, where turning, more turning movements are, are, are present. And so to reduce it on Wilmer Avenue, I think, would, would, would not work as well as anticipated. I've just noticed different traffic patterns with the changes in, at Bethesda and with some of those. And so it's just an ongoing concern because people yep. don't drive the speed limit. You get passed on the, you know, on the right lane and um, those types of things. So I, I just am concerned about the speed yep. on that street. What I can tell you from what I know of, these, of the speed studies, what happens is they go out and they, they take a, they physically watch and clock the cars and they take a percentile of the traffic that's going by and then they set the speed that is their speed study set the speed based on that so um, we've been told a number of times that if 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 you get someone involved to do a speed study um, a lot of times it will recommend a faster speed than what you currently have so Councilor Fagerly thank you Mr. Mayor <coughs> Sean and that <clears throat> chemical for the ice and snow are we buying it together with the county or the state so we buy a bigger quantity and get it cheaper or? yeah uh, councilmember Fagley for for this trial period for this year we're gonna team up with the county and try to um, use some of their buying power and some of their um, supply if you will just for a trial period before we invest the money to to have it on on site Thank you very much for your report. Um, if we have the issue uh, that we can control the speed by the schools, um, you will remember that Community Christian came to us and asked us to reduce the speed by them. And also, is it something we look at for over by Roosevelt? So those are those two school areas over there that people have had concerns about in the past. I don't know that Roosevelt has a 30 there, do they? Don't they still? I think have Roosevelt 40? and CCS both have 30 right now. They do. They do have 30s now. Okay. When the which lights is, are flashing. When, when the lights are flashing. Yep. Okay. And which is which is the lowest we're allowed to go per per statute. So. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. You just stumped the mayor. So. Okay. Anybody else have anything for the uh, public works director? Thank you very much for your report. Appreciate it. Well, as Mr. Holland, you stated when we get through with some of those big sticky issues that we had, um, we will, these reports will go faster. So it appears that that's working. Um, thank you for their finance director and our public works director for giving us what I look at as a very thorough report. Um, so that's very helpful, um, which leaves us a little bit of time if there's anything that the council wishes to discuss and talk about, Council Member Schwantes. Thank you, as long as we have time. I would be interested in having staff uh, look at a social media policy, and I don't know if there has been any discussion about that at this point, but I think it might be a wise investment of time. Um, how fortuitous for you to mention that, because <laughs> if you saw my newsletter, I, I plan on attending a conference on social media and the Internet and local governments. And uh, yes, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, I did have a discussion with staff and asked that very question, do we have a social media policy? And if we don't, let's uh, look at what others have and kind of explore that. And just as a side note, I know that when I arrived here, and I've mentioned at least, at least on two occasions since I've been here in the last seven months, that um, writing letters to the editor of a paper, posting things on Facebook or on the Internet, 
Um, all those types of things are, you know, uh, part of your job and, you know, you represent the city. Uh, just because you go home and you get on your the computer, that doesn't mean that you can post things. Uh, and I said it in particular about, you know, the council or myself or the city in general because that's their employer. And I've had these issues in other communities where we did have some employees, um, you know, making comments about other employees and even their mother-in-laws. I had one. Uh, so it got pretty scandalous there. And so um, we need to address that. And I hope here in the next 60 days to maybe come out with something uh, for all of our employees to understand. But it is a, a growing trend and it's something that we need to address. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you. Just a follow up to that. I, if we're going to do a policy, I think the League of Minnesota Cities are in, and also has some training available. And so I think more than just a policy, we probably need to have some sort of both for staff and for council, um, that, some training that I think is appropriate for um, some of the things we're facing right now. So. And I will do that. We're trying to utilize the League more and more, and, and I agree we can probably find some good resources there. And just to follow up on, on, on the conference that you're going to be attending, you know, I think that, you know, as the mayor, I support staff attending conferences uh, to stay current on their job, and uh, particularly when we have issues that are facing us. And um, the only thing uh, when this came to us is I, I, I uh, received an email from Mr. Holland earlier last week, and I just said, make sure and advise the council what's going on, because none of us want surprises. I mean, we all want to do good governance, and but we don't want to hear um, that, you know, our city administrator was out in Denver, Colorado, or wherever this conference is. I think you said it was Denver area. And um, via Vegas. No. Via Vegas. <laughs> yeah. But the city, yeah. So, so, you know, it's nice that we know about this stuff. Mm. I mean, you know, um, when I was fire chief, and I think you guys that are in business know this as well, but you don't want to surprise. You know, you don't want something that surprises you when you're when you're sitting around the table and, and somebody say, oh, you know, we were out in Denver and we ran to the city administrator in Denver. And you go, when did he go to Denver? I didn't know he was out of town. Mm -hmm. So thank you for right. in, having it in your notes. And I know when it gets closer, you'll remind us again. But exactly. um, it's very important that we keep our staff well trained. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Else? Mayor, if I could say, um, to answer um, uh, Councilman uh, Alvarado's question, uh, we are going to try that this weekend. Uh, I, Gary said this morning, so the brine. Okay. So you'd ask that question. And then uh, the council member Nelson, uh, I've been talking with Dr. Holmes, and he will be bringing a letter and a request. And uh, I've been working with him um, on at least two conversations as far as the safety and the speed limit in that area. And so uh, we're on top of that. And I will be attending a ribbon cutting ceremony here in a couple of weeks that he invited me to. I don't know if he invited, uh, but we'll be attending that. So we'll make sure that's covered. And in fact, that's my own neighborhood. So I want to make sure that it's safe. So thank Good. you. Okay. So Mr. Holland, one other thing that we have laying out there that we really <clears throat> haven't talked about recently is the downtown area. And I spoke with uh, Councilmember Fagerly. So if we get it on our list to get that meeting scheduled with Bridget, yourself, and Councilmember Fagerly and I, sometime hopefully middle of next month, we don't want to do it in the next two weeks, but um, first week or two in, in January to where we can get that conversation going about the downtown because you know we want to keep that on the forefront because our downtown is a very valuable area uh, within our community and want to just make sure we keep that on the front burner. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty um, with the council and just kind of brief a little bit for the Eagle Lake discussion later in, in our regular meeting. And uh, this is going to the straight to the regular meeting because we had talked about it in work session before. But what we're looking for there is that as we had talked at the conclusion of that meeting, that we'd bring it back to the council tonight and that we would take action. And what, we're, what, what I'm requesting from you is to give staff permission to work with the county on what that would look like in, um, for taking over the ownership of the Eagle Lake Sanitary Sewer. 
you know, when we take a look at that, we've been providing those services for over 40 years to them. Uh, they've been predominantly satisfied. We've been predominantly satisfied as well. And I think that we just need to look at that. So what I'll be requesting in the regular session, uh, regular council meeting, is that the council uh, make a motion to support um, the taking over ownership of the sanitary sewer out at Eagle Lake, have staff and the city attorney work on developing that ordinance that would make that happen, and then that bring that back to a work session, and then bring it back to a regular council meeting. And because this would be buy, buying properties, then what we'd have to do is we'd have to follow the whole uh, rules on that, and the city attorney and I spoke on that this afternoon. And so there are certain things that we have to do when we do uh, acquire property, as you guys will remember. Um, so we'll have to make sure we follow all that too. But it's imperative that if we want to keep the county doing the billing for us, which is a huge savings for us, by the way, um, if we want the county to do that billing, then what we have to do is we have to have that information to them so that they know what that bill is going to be before they prepare the tax statements because it goes on the tax bill is where it goes. And again, they collect that twice a year, make that payment to the city twice a year. So I just wanted to kind of introduce that, seeing we had some time and if there was questions the council had about that because there's not a whole lot in your packet. Actually, there's nothing in your packet about it. But I just kind of wanted to brief you on that. So. Um, Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You mentioned buying property. Isn't isn't the sewer system presently under an easement? Isn't there an easement around the whole thing so uh, it can be accessed? In, in that we don't. That I don't know. But that's what I want the, to have the city attorney look into. I don't know if it's under an easement or if it's actually. You know, I'm assuming that. But have to be so. That yeah, you can I'm assuming access. the pump stations. Or even the line. I mean, the right. sewer line. Yeah, and, I, and that I don't know. We didn't have answers for that. that you know, the meeting, two meetings ago. So. And then the uh, the amount that they're going to pay per property uh, is going to remain the same or? For 2018, correct. 2018. Because the tax bills have already been sent out. Okay, and then anything that would um, increase after 18, um, they'll share in that increase? I mean, is it going to be like in a percentage the same as the cities? If ours goes up 4%, those goes up 4% or? Um, it's going to be handled differently. We haven't talked about that at this point, um, and I think those are the details that will get worked out. But I think if you take a look at the flows, you know, they, they, they said that they have about 55,000 gallon flow per household. And if you take a look at that flow, and if you take and look at an average house on what that would be, you know, Mr. Gerbitz said that, you know, that is what is in the equation. Currently, Candy White County retains 35,000 a year mm -hmm. of that money, they're going to give all of that to us. Right. So they're not going to retain anything. So they're going to provide this service to us at no cost. Um, and, you know, <coughs> the details will come, you know, the details are in, the facts are in the details, if you will, but, you know, want to make sure that our staff knows that some of the questions we're going to have for them to bring back in this agreement. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that our city administrator will be updating us probably on a monthly basis as where that's at. But I feel it's quite imperative that we have this done no later than the end of June because then that allows everything to happen so that it can be in the tax bill for the following year. The 35 grand that was, that was in a kitty for maintenance, wasn't it? Correct. Yep. Exactly. So, uh, right. And they had uh, a lot of that, taking it out of the funds that people were paying and set it aside, correct? Correct. Yep. So we were getting what was it, 280 a year or something like that? 285, approximately 289. So be plus the 35. Well, 219 <laughs> is what it ends up being. Okay. I'm sorry, 319. 319. Yeah. 319. Right. Yep. Well, 319. And um, you know, I talked to Larry Kleindahl about this on Friday, and you know, they brought it up at the county uh, at their last work session or at their last um, meeting. And the majority of the uh, county commissioners were on board with it, of making it happen. Um, and so he felt comfortable in saying that if we came forward with a motion to work on this, that we'd be able to get it done. So. Um, I was looking for the minutes from that joint meeting. Do you know where they are or when we got them? Because I, I wasn't successful in locating them. 
came in an email last week. Last week? Last week, and the email came, if I remember right, came directly from Mr. Gerbitz, right? Or did it come from Mr. Christensen? I don't rem remember who sent it. I thought Gerbitz Mike did. Must Does anybody? He's saying Mike Gerbitz sent it out to everybody. But yeah. that, that was Actually, it came the week. It might have came the week you were gone. I don't remember seeing it. Yeah. I'll look for it. Thank you. Yep. Does anybody else have anything? Councilman uh, Fagerly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is B to Mr. Peterson. <laughs> so the sewer system at Eagle Lake is not in the city limits. If they come in, will we have to provide white, uh, water then? I don't believe the city has any obligation to extend utilities unless it's practical. Uh, our zoning ordinance says that all new development should have municipal services when it's practical to provide it to the site, but there's nothing in there that mandates it within a city ordinance. Um, you know, that's a decision the council will have to make about the whole annexation process. Because didn't the city of Winona have a big lawsuit back in the 90s? They were providing sewer and then the people wanted water too? I don't recall. Okay. I thought it was at your committee, so I remember it. Can we check into that, Mr. Holland? <clears throat> I can check city, into that and, and I know each state is unique and I would just say this, I have a lot of experience in Colorado providing you know sewer and water and electric and different utilities outside the boundaries of who I represented whether it was a county or a city and again this is Colorado but you had no obligation to provide those utilities outside you know your own municipality okay. I just and so that that's one of the things to uh, answer councilman Christensen's question this is this is an outside uh, service that we're providing and that's one of the things that as we're negotiating I'm going to keep in mind and they need to keep that in mind too like you said that this is not an annexation and so we have an obligation of fiduciary responsibility to who to the citizens of Wilmer right. That's right. and so we have to keep that in mind when they start talking about the maintenance and the repairs and the fees and so I understand the dilemma out there but our first priority is to the citizens of Wilmer. And so, but we will negotiate this and, and treat it uh, as an outside service, not as a, an extension of our own, but as an outside service that we're providing. So I will keep that in mind. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead, Councilman Christian. We do that with fire protection. Yep. yep. Is there anything else we do outside service? Other than the landfill bringing leachate in and bringing it to our waste treatment plant. That bring that, they bring that to us. Yeah. Mr. Okins, is there, um, is there anything when you're reviewing contracts and GPAs that bind us to anything? I know that we have some, if we're available, services, but nothing that binds us. Is there? Mm, I, I would have to uh, research that, Mr. Mayor. I know there's a, a lot of joint powers agreements, but those are yeah. primarily with other governmental agencies and, and organizations. So um, uh, this time of the year, we are reviewing all agreements right. again. We do it tw twice a year, and so we will uh, uh, convey anything that we find to the administrator's office. And Mr. Holland, maybe we can have that report for us in January at a work session. Remember Nelson. Hate to be high maintenance, but the email we got on December 5th has the PowerPoint presentations. It doesn't have the minutes from the meeting. I was trying to go back to the minutes, the minutes regarding the discussion that took place at that joint meeting. So if somebody knows where they are or can find them, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Wilkins. Mr. Mayor, I believe they should be uh, listed in the uh, work session minutes that are listed in... in no, that was a county-run meeting. It was an hour. Oh, you're looking for a different one than was yep. just held at at here. Right. Sorry. Yeah, one the one that was held out at the um, Health and Human Services Building. So we didn't take minutes. 
No, the we county, the minutes. county took the, the county minutes. took minutes. Right, right. The county took the minutes of that meeting. And Mr. Gerbitz is the one that put that document together, as I recall. I may be wrong there, but I think I'm correct. Yeah, there's nothing attached. Yeah, she sent the second one later. Anything else for the good of the order? Is the minutes we're looking for from when we were out at the county? Right. That, okay. Yeah, they called it. They called it meeting five. Is what they called it. Okay. So, I believe somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's correct, isn't it? They called it meeting five. Meeting five. <laughs> I, I will get the minutes from Larry and have them sent over. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, we'll stand in recess until we have, I'm sorry, we will adjourn this meeting until uh, we convene at 7 p.m. <coughs>